Our next speaker is uh, Dr. Glenn Peters from Cicero, Center for International Climate Research in Oslo. His keynote title is The Trouble with Negative uh, Emissions. He's a senior researcher at Cicero. And um, I didn't know actually that you, you come from this environment as a postdoctoral uh, researcher at the Industrial Ecology, Ecology Program at uh, NTNU. Um, he's been working on uh, looking into pathways for low carbon futures, uh, developed a methodology to track progress towards the goals of the Paris Agreement, and is investigating methods to assess the feasibility of emission pathways consistent with low temperature targets, and he is part of the Scientific Steering Committee of the Global Carbon Project. I just want to add, you know, that uh, that Glenn is one of my heroes, and one I, I follow on on Twitter, and, and and this guy, actually, his tweets are trustworthy and, and worth reading, so please, Glenn, you know. Thank you. And uh, those of you on Twitter, I actually decided to try and live tweet this presentation, but we're a bit five minutes behind schedule, so my live tweets are five minutes ahead of schedule. So I can do that, but I can't get the date right on my presentation, so my apologies. Um, so as Niels mentioned, I, I was based in, in Trondheim for several years, from 2004 to 2008. I, I lived in Trondheim, um, worked just across the hallway here in the Industrial Ecology Program, and something stuck in my head when I was walking out of my apartment in Oslo. I just sort of, I should grab my raincoat. And so luckily I, I grabbed my raincoat. So I'm going to talk about the trouble with negative emissions. It was a, a paper, a commentary that I had with Kevin Anderson sort of second half of, of last year. It got a little bit of pushback from some quarters and a lot of support from other quarters. So as you could probably imagine, people that are supporting renewables or against bioenergy or against CCS thought the commentary was fantastic. And some people working in the CCS community, direct air capture, uh, were less than impressed. I'll touch on some of these uh, points throughout the, the presentation. So what are negative emissions? I'm not going to spend much time on this slide, but there's a whole range of different negative emission technologies. Uh, afforestation, you can grow trees to take carbon out of the atmosphere. Uh, biochar or, or soil management to sequester carbon more generally, uh, ocean fertilisation, direct air capture, which is perhaps my favourite one out of these, the, the super technology, a machine that sucks carbon out of the air, enhanced weathering where you basically throw rocks on the ground and, and uh, take up carbon, and last of all, bioenergy with CCS. And I'm mainly going to talk about negative emissions associated with bioenergy with CCS. Most of what I'll say will apply to the other types of negative emissions, but I'm going to talk about bioenergy with CCS because it's used so prevalently in the emission scenarios, the pathways that keep us below two degrees. So what are these emission scenarios? We use emission scenarios because we basically don't know what's going to happen in the future. We basically don't know what's going to happen one or two years ahead. And certainly we don't know what's going to ha happen 50 to 100 years ahead, and so we use emission scenarios to explore these uncertainties. These are the 1,200 or so emission scenarios assessed in the IPCC fifth assessment report, which came out 2013-2014. Uh, this is showing the, the CO2 emissions, carbon dioxide emissions from those scenarios, and you can see there's a, a very big range going out to 2,100. At the top there, you have the sort of brown and the red scenarios. These are baseline scenarios. Emission scenarios, if we don't have any climate policies, that'll take us to, you know, maybe three, four, five degrees towards the end of the century. Down the bottom, you have these uh, mitigation pathways, the two, two and a half degree scenarios. Uh, these are the ones that are, let's say, broadly consistent or getting consistent with the, the Paris Agreement. Somewhat surprisingly, there's a bit of a gap between the two in the middle. You know, if you go straight across around that RCP six, there's uh, not so much, uh, so many scenarios, which is, a little bit interesting because this is perhaps where we may head and so we should have a lot more analysis on that area, I think. But today I'm going to talk about these two degree scenarios. The IPCC assessed about 120 of these scenarios. You can see, broadly speaking, they travel the same sort of pathways, if you like, but there is some variation. What's causing the variation? There's different integrated assessment models used to generate these pathways, about 15 different models here. They have different start dates with climate policy, so some have global climate policy starting in 2010, some in 2030, and, and so on. 
and they have different assumptions about technology and the different scenarios to explore some of the key uncertainties. But one thing that's quite consistent is that these scenarios pretty much all drop below zero. At some stage towards the end of the century, they remove carbon from the atmosphere at the global level. And external to the integrated assessment community, maybe external a little bit to this community here, there's quite a poor understanding of negative emissions, what they mean, the consequences and so on. And this is really where this uh, commentary with Kevin Anderson came from. So the next few minutes I want to talk through the, uh, the figure that we had in this, uh, this commentary. It's the same sort of axes and format as the previous figure. So here we have historical emissions going up to 2015, rapid growth as I'm sure you all know. This uh, line here is an indicative two degree scenario, so basically I've taken the average, the median of those blue scenarios, those two degree scenarios I showed you before, net emissions, so this is like a stylized two degree scenario. We have this net negative part towards the end of the century starting around about 2070. But basically this is how scenarios are more or less presented, you just see this line that drops below zero, but there's very little understanding of what it actually means. And I've called it net emissions because it's the sum of some things that go out of the atmosphere and some things that go uh, back out of the atmosphere. So in these scenarios, if you add up all the fossil fuels, uh, emissions, industrial emissions and emissions from land use change, you will get this uh, red part here, which is much above the black line, which means that the negative emissions, the actual carbon removed from the atmosphere, more or less starts today. So depending on the model and the scenario and so on, you will have these negative emissions generated from basically today and they scale up to about 15 billion tonnes of CO2 per year at the end of the century. I'll come back to the scale in a minute, but this is something like covering India one or two times in bioenergy crops if you take that path. So this is very large scale um, use of negative emissions. In the commentary we called negative emissions a moral hazard. I think some people have maybe misunderstood what we meant by that. So just a few clarifications there. This is what the fossil fuel, industrial and land use emissions look like if you have negative emissions, if you have bioenergy with CCS in your model. If you run the model without this technology, uh, this is sort of a bit stylized, but this is where emissions would need to go. So if there's no negative emissions, you have to have a much more rapid reduction in your uh, fossil fuel and industrial emissions. And so what we meant by a moral hazard is if that we follow the top of this red line here on the assumption that we have this really large scale, you know, one or two times India scale negative emissions, if we follow that path and it turns out that we can't generate negative emissions at that scale, then we've locked into a higher temperature change. It's the future generations that will pay for that temperature change and so this is where the moral hazard argument comes in. And what we really meant is as a precautionary approach, we should reduce emissions a little bit faster than we would have otherwise planned, um, and in the risk that we don't get these negative emissions at scale. So next couple of slides, I'm going to take a slightly different theme, still building around negative emissions, but looking at some different aspects. So I'm sure many of you have heard of the concept of the carbon budget. So if you integrate that curve, get the area under the black line that I showed you in the previous figure, the two degree scenarios, then we can figure out how much carbon we can emit to stay below two degrees. And it's something like a thousand billion tonnes, which is you know, 25 years or so at, at current emission rates. There's a lot of uncertainty. It could be 600 billion tonnes, it could be 1,200 billion tonnes. I don't want to get into the uncertainty, but I want to look at the consequences of CCS. So if you have CCS, as I'm sure you're all aware, you can burn more fossil fuels, which effectively increases the size of the carbon budget. If you also have CCS on bioenergy, so fossil fuel and bioenergy CCS, then you can pretty much double the remaining carbon budget. And so if you look at how much fossil fuels are used in terms of carbon in these scenarios, so coal, coal with CCS, oil, gas, and gas with CCS, then you can use a lot more than what the remaining carbon budget indicates. So the fossil fuel use here is much more than the dark grey, the remaining carbon budget. It doesn't go all the way to the top of the negative emissions because a lot of the negative emissions are used to offset ongoing non-CO2 emissions such as methane and so on. The other part of the negative emissions are used to offset ongoing CO2 emissions or CO2 emissions that have happened in the past. If you remove CCS entirely from these models and look at what the pathways would be, you see that you can use a lot less coal, oil and gas and the total is about consistent 
with the remaining carbon budget, as you would expect. So CCS on fossil fuels industry and bioenergy really allows a lot more fossil fuel consumption. And you can see why many environmental groups completely hate CCS. Another something that's not well understood about um, uh, negative emissions is how it varies across emission scenarios, different temperature levels. So this figure is quite different in style. It's a histogram. So on the vertical axis, we have a count of scenarios. There's 120 scenarios altogether. The, sorry, the horizontal axis here is the bioenergy with CCS in terms of energy consumption. And this is showing that around about one to 300 exajoules per year of bioenergy is used in these two degree scenarios. Actually, the median temperature in these scenarios is below two degrees, about 1.6. I won't go into the details there. But what people tend not to realise is that no matter what temperature level you go to, as soon as you start mitigating, these integrated assessment models start using negative emissions, and somewhat at scale. So you can see the, the size of the figures here. There's a lot of negative emissions in different temperature levels. Why is that? To stabilise temperature at pretty much any level, you have to stop emitting carbon dioxide. Because you have some residual positive emissions, you need some negative emissions to offset that. There are some other aspects which I'll touch in a minute, but no matter what temperature you stabilise, these scenarios and models are using a lot of negative emissions. Just quickly, a, a few clarifications. I've mentioned these things together, uh, already a little bit. Even if we call Bex a, a moral hazard, it still me means we need research, development and deployment, we still need to get going on negative emissions. The point we we're trying to make is if the negative emissions don't work at scale, which they may not, then we need to uh, be a little bit more proactive with mitigation in the short term. And in this context, you can treat it as a pleasant surprise. If negative emissions works, then great. We can go to an even lower temperature level. Uh, but we shouldn't depend on it. Well, that was the moral hazard aspect. Another point we wanted to make is that you can't just accept the model results as they are. You really have to go in and test them and see what they mean. Are they robust? Are they realistic? I'll come back to that in a minute. And as I had on the last slide, no matter what temperature we stabilise, we're probably going to need negative emissions. So I'm at, I don't know, the most preeminent carbon capture and storage conference in the world, and I've got a slide, the trouble with carbon capture and storage. This is uh, meant to be a little bit provocative. I had to figure out something to put on the subtitle, so what better than this? So here we have the level of carbon capture and storage in terms of CO2 volume in those uh, two degree scenarios I showed you. Don't worry about the colours for now, I'll come back to that in a minute. But the top end scenarios here are taking out about, or capturing and storing about 40 billion tonnes of CO2 per year by the end of the century. So we currently emit about 40 billion tonnes of CO2 per year. So these are big numbers. Um, capturing and storing the same volume of CO2 that we generate today in some of these scenarios, something like eight or ten times the volume of the oil industry. So this, these are big numbers. Looking at the mid-century there, around 2040, 2050, there's rather high growth rates, depending on the scenario, something like five or ten billion tonnes of CO2 capture per decade added. You can do the math at something like a, a new facility you know, every other day for the next 100 years. We're talking tens of thousands here in terms of facilities. These are big numbers. The different colours here are different integrated assessment models. And so you'll see there's sort of one model at the top here which has high CCS. There's other models which have lower CCS. So depending on the model that you use and some of the assumptions in the scenarios you have, you'll get different levels of CCS. But broadly speaking, very large levels of CCS. Why do models love CCS? So first of all, why do you accept the results? Or why do the modelers say that these results are OK? So if you look at historical um, examples, you can take coal. I'm sure many of you have heard of China building two or three coal power plants per week during its sort of growth phase. This is broadly consistent with the CCS levels in some of the scenarios. So you could say, well, no, we could physically, technically do it. These are optimization models, so I'm sure everyone in here, or many people in here, understand optimization models. They have their various quirks. Essentially, to state the obvious, the reason these models are using a lot of negative emissions, or a lot of CCS, is it turns out that short-term reductions in emissions are more expensive than the cost of negative emissions in the long run, <laughs> which is rather obvious. And this has given the model constraints, the model parameters, and the model structure. I think there's probably been 
not sufficient analysis of some of these issues. What are the parameters? What are the constraints? What is the structure of the model? Is there something structural which is causing this to happen? You know, are there, is it just a backstop technology that's popping in and, and so on and so forth? And when modelers have tried to compare why does your model have more CCS than my model, they basically don't know. They've tried to, to go in and, and figure this out, but it's very hard to determine because these optimization models have become so complex with hundreds, if not thousands, of constraints, thousands of parameters, and they can't really figure out what it is which is causing CCS to be used at different rates in different models. So even if we can figure out the CCS puzzle, if you want negative emissions, you need to figure out the bioenergy puzzle as well. I'll just be quick on this slide. These are the emission scenarios again. They are using between 1 and 300 exajoules of, um, per year of bioenergy. That's something like a quarter to three quarters of the current energy system. So these are big numbers again. And interestingly, 1 to 300 exajoules is in an area where scientists start to argue about the sustainability of bioenergy. Can we produce bioenergy at that scale sustainably and in a carbon neutral way? We're not sure. We debate today about very small levels of bioenergy, tiny levels of bioenergy. We argue whether it's sustainable. Here we're using you know, half the world's energy system in bioenergy, so there's going to be a lot of debates that need to be played out with this bioenergy. Similar to with CCS, when people try and compare their model with someone else's model, there's a variety of factors which may cause high or low bioenergy use in the model. Some of them are listed here, I won't go through them but they can't figure out why, or they haven't invested the time to see why one model uses more or less bioenergy than other models. They're focusing on other big questions, incorporating SDGs in their models and so on, as opposed to understanding what is going on in the model, I would say. They may disagree with that, of course. So finishing up, some research needs. Now this is very sort of biased, it's not my view on all research that's um, possible, but focusing on a few key aspects that I think are, are relevant here. And uh, it's not popping to the next slide. I don't know if you can manually pop to the... <laughs> so, first of all, I'm sure everyone out here will solve many of the plant level problems that we may have. But as you, I show, was showing you before, the scale of CCS and negative emissions in some of these scenarios is huge. Are there engineering limits to the scale that we can go? How fast can we deploy uh, negative emissions, bioenergy, CCS, at the scales in these models? Can we do it? Um, has an, no engineer has really gone in and tried to, let's say, validate these models. So the modelers say the level of negative emissions is technically feasible. That's what they say their models give you, is technical feasibility. What would an engineer say? Would an engineer say that 40 billion tonnes of CO2 capture per year is feasible? Incentivising negative emissions, so we can make the best, fanciest machine in the world to cap capture and store carbon unless someone is willing to throw a billion or a trillion or whatever dollars it is um, to get this going at scale. There's no point developing that machine. How do you incentivise negative emissions? And we're really missing some of the very basic characteristics or aspects. Accounting systems, and we've been talking about value chains, getting accounting systems working along these value chains when you might have bioenergy produced in Africa. Is it, bio, is it carbon neutral? Goes to the UK where it's combusted and may be accounted there, it may go to Norway where it's stored, what's the liability question, how do you transfer funds along that value chain, we're talking billions of dollars here at these scales, uh, different levels of governance across countries, to get the accounting system working to have this as a robust system will be really hard. This is a very basic ingredient, what policy structures and business models, some people are working on this, but unless you have policy certainty, looking at what's going on in the US, in Australia, in many countries in terms of climate policy, if you don't have 30, 40, 50 year certainty in your policy, no one's going to throw huge amounts of money at some of these technologies. One thing I want to sort of point out is that, again, getting to the scale question, if you want to solve the two degree challenge, having a few CCS facilities, let's say 10 here and 10 there and, and so on, will help very, very little bit. But we need this gigaton scale. We're talking 5, 10, 20 billion tonnes per year. You know, 10,000 facilities, not 10 facilities. So it's this order of magnitude step that we need to be talking about. I'm not sure that we could ever see something like coal with CCS. This has been mentioned before. The business model to get coal and coal with CCS is quite difficult. Industrial applications will be important. And at scale, bioenergy with CCS 
maybe your saviour in a sense, because we need negative emissions. We need some way to remove carbon from the atmosphere. We've basically emitted too much already, so we need bioenergy with CCS at scale, and this could be a great opportunity in the future. And I'll finish up there. Thank you. Very interesting. <laughs> uh, before you get that, you know. Um, <laughs> Damn. So, so, are there any questions for uh, for Glenn? A lot of provocative stuff here. That's, uh... Oh yes. Uh, that's uh, Tore Toy previously of Stutter, now independent consultant. So you can state a question. Very interesting presentation, but there's uh, towards your end. There's something I would make this comment from Chairman Mao. He said that even the long march, which changed China, which is not a big, big, it's not a small job. It started with one step. When you say that small scale CCS is not useful, you're killing yourself. Thank you. <laughs> comment that? Sure, so I agree, you have to start somewhere, you have to take that first step, but um, your vision has to be that gigaton scale. And so, you know, I don't know about everyone's research, uh, exactly what they're doing, but um, that research sort of has to have that long sort of vision that we don't want to get one facility, we want to get 10,000 facilities. So is that, does that change your research today? I, I don't know, but um, so I agree with you, but it's that vision of getting that scale. We've got another question here. Yeah, I'm Eric Lindeberg. Uh, with 6,000 point sources of unabated concentrated CO2, uh, I don't understand this emphasis on uh, taking CO2 out of very dilute air in 40 years. I mean, this is sort of a, it sounds like, okay, if you can't make it, you say it's very difficult to, to do the CCS now but we can do uh, negative emission in 40 years. Sounds very good for politicians. We don't need to do anything now. We don't care about the concentrated 6,000 point sources that you already have. We do uh, re reduction later, long after the, they have any more responsibility. I think this might, the, all, all this smoke about this uh, negative emission, it can be a uh, tactic for, to defer the whole thing and not solve any problem. Yeah, I'll take that, I guess, as a comment because you just explained quite well <laughs> what we call the moral hazard in the, in the paper. So I agree, agree with that. Okay, I think we need to draw it to a close there. Thank you very much, uh, Glenn, you know, and here's a small token of appreciation. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks.